thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, great to, to give a talk uh, in your online seminar, which is very nice. So yeah, I'm going to talk about some uh, joint work with Sasha Viktorova, um, which is all about this invariant called the defect uh, for a cubic threefold. And so everything I talk about is going to be over the complex numbers. So I'm going to write that down already, just so I didn't forget. So throughout the talk, whenever I kind of write x, this is always going to be a cubic threefold. Um, but I'm going to be considering uh, cubics which have isolated singularities. And I guess most of the time I'm also going to be assuming that this this cubic is not a cone over a uh, a, a cubic surface. Okay. So um, so we, let's just dive straight in. So what is this invariant called the defect? So the uh, the defect I'm going to denote it by sigma. And it's defined to be, well, the rank of the, the following group. So we take the, the group of V divisors on X and we mod out by the group of, of uh, Cartier divisors on X. And we take the rank. So this is the, the definition. And I want to kind of motivate this talk by kind of telling you hopefully a, a few different reasons as to why this is an interesting invariant. So the first reason why it's, it's kind of interesting is, I mean, obviously it's measuring this difference between V divisors and Cartier divisors. And so it's measuring the failure of Q factorality for your cubic threefold. And so this has been studied in the case of Fano threefolds um, with, uh, with nodes by many people. And uh, I want to just maybe highlight a particular result of uh, Chartsov, who studied the case of uh, nodal cubic threefolds. And uh, what, what he showed is that the nodal cubic threefolds are Q factorial uh, if the number of nodes is uh, strictly less than four. And so what could go wrong when you have uh, more than, uh, or if you have uh, uh, four nodes, so if you have, if the number of nodes is equal to four, then what can happen is that all of these, uh, all of the nodes may lie on a plane. So all nodes may lie on a plane. And if this happens, this plane P will necessarily be contained in your cubic uh, threefold X. And so this will exactly give you a V divisor uh, that is not Cartier. And so the defect will be positive. <coughs> uh, and so this is the case so if the nodes are, are not contained in a plane, if we assume that the nodes are in general position, then the defect will be zero uh, until you get to six nodes. So what happens when you have six nodes? Well, it turns out that having uh, six nodes in general position, this is equivalent to your cubic threefold being determinantal. So the equation defining X is given by a determinant of some matrix. And so a result of Hassett and Schinkel and maybe some also kind of uh, work kind of later, maybe explaining that results in, in some, some more detail by Dolgachev uh, shows that a, a determinantal cubic threefold um, will contain a uh, what's called a rational normal cubic scroll. So what is this? This is a non-degenerate surface that lives inside of P4 and has degree three. Uh, and so if your cubic contains such a surface, a rational normal cubic scroll, this is also an example of a V divisor that is not Cartier. 
And so in this case as well, the defect of such an X will be positive. <clears throat> so this is the, the kind of the situation for when we have uh, just a nodal cubic, but somehow nothing uh, has really, up until this point, nothing was really studied for kind of worse singularities than nodes. So this is kind of the first reason why this, uh, this invariant, the defect is kind of interesting. Um, so maybe let me give you some more reasons. Uh, so the second reason is that this, this defect actually measures some, uh, some properties about your cohomology of your cubic threefold. So in particular, it, it measures the failure of Poincaré duality. So, so what do I mean by this? So a result of uh, Steenbrink and Namakawa So they have a result which says that if X is a normal projective uh, threefold with only isolated singularities and also uh, the space of holomorphic two forms uh, is zero, uh, then one can calculate the defect by uh, looking at the difference between the fourth Betty number of X and the second Betty number of X. Oh, I, the singularities, sorry, uh, there was an extra condition. The, they not only do they have to be isolated, the singularities also have to be rational singularities. And so in particular, uh, a cubic threefold satisfies all of these conditions. And so we can, uh, we can get some information about our, our cohomology of our cubic threefold by using uh, this interpretation. So this is all, um, you know, hopefully, again, hopefully I want to try and convince you this is an interesting invariant to study, but somehow neither of these reasons were kind of my original motivation for studying this invariant. So the kind of last reason I want to tell you about uh, why this is interesting was actually my uh, initial uh, motivation into this, into this subject. And so what is the, why, what am I talking about? Well, this, uh, this, uh, this invariant is actually connected uh, to the existence of reducible fibers um, of so-called intermediate Jacobian vibrations. So I'll explain what that means in a second. So reducible fibers of intermediate Jacobian vibrations. So what is an intermediate Jacobian vibration? So we start instead with a, a cubic uh, fourfold now. So this is a smooth cubic fourfold. And we look at hyperplane sections of V. And so we can look at the open subset of P5 dual, which parameterizes, you know, smooth sections, smooth hyperplane sections. And so a point in here will correspond to a smooth um, cubic, uh, a smooth cubic threefold. And what one can do is associate to it an abelian variety, namely the intermediate Jacobian of that cubic threefold. And so one can do this in families over, uh, over the locus uh, U, parameterizing smooth hyperplane sections. And so this vibration is, is sometimes called the donaghy markman vibration. Okay. And so it, a result of, uh, of Laza, Sakar, and Voisin, well, what they do is they construct a hypercalar compactification And it doesn't, I'm not really going to talk too much about the hypercalar uh, aspect today, but the important thing is that there's, there's a compactification 
uh, very natural of this intermediate Jacobian vibration. So this guy uh, over the whole of the, the whole uh, base. And so um, I should mention that this this compactification was constructed uh, when V is general uh, by Laza, Sack and Vosan. So they construct for V a general cubic fourfold. And so in the case when when V is general, what they actually uh, obtain is that is the vibration with irreducible fibers. So pi has irreducible fibers. And so this existence of such a compactification, this was actually extended by Sakar to the case of all cubic fourfolds. So she does all cubic fourfolds. But it's not a constructive uh, proof, it's really an existence proof. So uh, not constructive. And now the vibration pi that one obtains it may have irreducible fibers. Have reducible fibers rather. And indeed a result of Brosnan uh, says that if there exists a hyperplane section of your cubic fourfold, we'll call it X, uh, that has positive defect, then the fiber over this corresponding hyperplane uh, will be reducible. And in fact, the number of uh, of uh, irreducible components of the fiber is bounded below uh, by the defect uh, plus one. And so if one wants to study uh, these vibrations when uh, your cubic fourfold is no longer general, uh, we really need to understand uh, the hyperplane sections that have positive defects. And so this was what really kind of led me to this problem, to studying this defect. So like I said, this invariant is a very interesting invariant and these kind of motivations kind of lead us towards three main goals. So the first one that we want to accomplish is to really understand uh, which cubic threefolds Uh, have positive defect. So which combination of singularities uh, will force this invariant to be positive? Uh, the second kind of goal which we want to accomplish is, okay, if we have positive defect, can we identify generators of, uh, of this group? So in other words, can we identify these classes of V divisors that are not Cartier. In turn, this will provide us uh, with some uh, geometric criteria for when uh, a cubic, for when a cubic fourfold has a hyperplane section with positive defect. So this is something that we can really, um, you know, hopefully we would, if we've identified these generators, uh, we are looking at cubic three folds which contain some sort of um, special surface. And so in turn, this cubic four fold will contain some special surface, which is kind of a, a, a very useful way to detect, um, uh, to, I, I guess, uh, identify these cubic four folds. And so our, our last goal, um, well, like I said before, the defect kind of uh, also uh, computes the Betty numbers, the difference between the Betty numbers uh, and well, it, uh, the difference between B4 and B2. 
And so if we want to kind of complete this, uh, this picture, we, we really have to also uh, compute the cohomology uh, for, for these uh, singular cubics. And when I say cohomology, what I really want to, what I really mean is we want to uh, compute the mixed Hodge structure um, on H3. So I'll also try and talk about this if I have some time at the end uh, briefly. So these are kind of the, the main goals that, that we have of this project. Uh, so before we you know, get started with identifying which cubic threefolds have positive defect, I need to tell you a little bit about what kind of singularities um, show up in this, in this situation. So the, the first thing I'm going to talk about is what, what are the possible singularities of a cubic threefold? So I mentioned before that the singularities that show up, are, they're all uh, rational singularities. And we're very fortunate in the fact that all uh, possible combinations have been classified. So all possible combinations of isolated singularities are classified. And they were classified by my collaborator, Sasha Viktorova, uh, in her thesis. So I'm going to maybe write down a, a summary of kind of the, the main result. So let, let's see what, what she says. So in particular, there are uh, 204 uh, possible combinations of singularities. And so, of course, I'm not going to list them for you. Um, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the combinations of ADE singularities. So a combination of ADE singularities, uh, if and only if the union of the Dinkin diagram of your combination is uh, 10A1, 5A2, or an induced subgraph of the following uh, diagram. So now this is when I wish I kind of drew it beforehand, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. So what one does is one takes the Dinkin diagram for um, the E6 tilde and glue, uh, well, joins together kind of three copies of the Dinkin diagram. And so we have the, the following kind of picture. So this is a kind of, there's three copies of E6 tilde kind of joined together. And so let me give you an example. So if I look at these vertices A, B, and C, and if I removed them from the graph, one could check that what I'd be left with is the Dinkin diagram for 3D4. And indeed, this occurs on a cubic, um, a cubic threefold. Okay. So these are the type of singularities um, that occur. And so maybe I'll make a few more remarks. So I should, uh, I, well, I'll leave the picture up for a little bit. So um, worse than AD singularities do appear. But I'm not really going to mention them today in my talk, and so I, I won't write any of them down. And um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just give to maybe give you more of a feeling. Some of the maximal ADE combinations that can happen. Well, the maximum number of nodes you can get is uh, is 10A1. Uh, the kind of the worst a n singularity that you can that you can get is a single a eleven, 
Um, but you can get kind of worse things. You can get things that are like D8 plus A3, uh, E7 plus A2 plus A1, uh, E8 plus A2, and yeah, you can find the rest of the list in uh, in uh, in Sasha's paper. But I just wanted to give you some kind of idea for what kind of singularities we're dealing with. And so now that we know what kind of singularities uh, appear, we want to start um, start trying to compute the defect for these possible singularities. And so I want to introduce kind of the, the, the main tools that we actually use to compute the defect. So tools to compute the defect. And actually the, the tools that we use are, are very kind of classical algebraic geometry tools. Um, so it's kind of a nice a nice picture. So so what what is the first tool? So the main tool that we use to compute the defect is the method of projection. So we're going to project uh, from a, a singular point. And so we're going to let Q be a singular point, and we're always going to change our coordinates on our cubic threefold so that it sits at the point you know zero 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 uh, one. So this is a singular point. And what this allows us to do is we can write our equation of x in the following way. We can write it as x4 times f2, where f2 is a homogeneous degree 2 polynomial in only the variables x0 through to x3. And then we add f3, so where this is a homogeneous uh, degree 3 polynomial, again in, in variables x0 to x3. And so when we project from the point uh, Q, we get a rational map from X to P3. And we resolve this by just simply blowing up the, uh, the point we're projecting from. And so inside this P3, we get two natural uh, surfaces that show up. So this Q here is obviously where this, uh, this quadric surface vanishes. And this S is this cubic threefold, uh, cubic surface rather, F3. And so we let CQ be the intersection, the complete intersection of these two, these two surfaces. And so this is a, a, a uh, well, this is a, a two-three complete intersection curve inside of P3. And this curve, what it does is it actually parameterizes the lines that are contained in X that pass through the singular point. Okay. And so um, one thing I, I should mention is that it, the type of singularity at Q uh, will affect the singularities of this, uh, this uh, quadric surface, uh, capital Q. And so in particular, if Q is an A1 singularity, then Q is this quadric surface is going to be smooth. Uh, if Q is an AN singularity with N bigger than one, then uh, this Q will become a quadric cone. Uh, and finally, if, if this Q becomes a D or an E singularity, uh, then this, this Q will become the union of two different planes. And if you have anything worse, which like I said, does happen, but I probably won't mention it too much today, then this Q will become a double plane. <clears throat> so this is kind of the first uh, tool that we're really going to use. And it also was the tool, uh, one of the main tools uh, for the classification of singularities. Um, so one really studies singularities of X by studying singularities of this curve, CQ. So are you able to, um, regards to CQ, is it clear how you're able to parameterize the lines? Um, yes, yeah, so I think if you uh, write down like a general point on this on this curve, you can kind of you can kind of show that the fiber uh, over this point is going to be all the, the line that passes through Q and intersects okay. uh, at that point. Yeah. Yeah, great question. 
Yeah, OK. Uh, and so what's the second tool? So the, the second tool is um, kind of an alternative description for this birational model um, of X. Uh, so maybe let me just write it down. So it turns out that the blow up at the point Q of X, this is actually isomorphic to the blow up of CQ, uh, the blow up of P3, sorry, <laughs> along this curve CQ. And so this fact, this is kind of more of a fact than a tool, um, but it's kind of, you know, classical well-known fact uh, in the, the case of X just having nodes. I think it goes back to Clemens and Griffiths. Um, but it turns out that it's also true allowing for worse singularities. Um, and uh, I think it was, at least it was written down uh, by Havasi in his, in his thesis. Um, but this is really what we're going to, what we're going to use. And so to, the kind of slogan for the rest of the talk is that really this curve CQ kind of governs the geometry of my cubic threefold X. And so what do I what do I mean by this? So the first thing uh, that I kind of briefly mentioned is that the singularities uh, of X are kind of mirrored by the singularities of uh, this curve CQ. And so this kind of goes back to a result of wall, uh, which says the following. So if CQ has a singular point of type T, uh, and let's suppose it's uh, away from the singularities of this quadric Q that, it, that the curve lies on, uh, then in this case, X also has a singularity of the same type. And in fact, you even know kind of where it is. It's going to be on the line. Uh, let's say the CQ has a point, singular point P. Then this uh, the singular point of X will be on the line that joins uh, P and Q together. Uh, so like I said, if, if the singularities are of X uh, away from away from this point Q, they really they they get projected to singularities of these curve of the curve. Um, we can say a little bit more. So also if if CQ has a singularity uh, at, of type T, I guess at a point. Um, uh, that is also on the singular locus of this quadric, then actually uh, the blow up um, of X at the point Q will have a singular point of type T on the inverse image under this projection map restricted to E. So lying on the exceptional divisor when we blew up uh, the point Q. So kind of using this result, the CQ really determines the combination of singularities um, for X, and it turns out that it also kind of governs the defect. So this kind of leads me to my uh, our first result. So so what is the theorem? So theorem one. So again, we're going to let X, as usual, be a cubic uh, threefold with isolated singularities. That's not a cone. And we're also going to let uh, K be the number of irreducible components of the curve CQ that we get uh, by projecting from a singular point. Uh, then it turns out one can confute the defect uh, by essentially counting the number of irreducible components of this curve. So it's going to be equal to k minus 1 uh, as long as this quadric is not the union of two planes. So not the union of two planes. And when it when it is the union of two planes, well, there's kind of an you have uh, you just have to subtract an additional component. So we have this very like kind of simple formula um, for computing the defect. 
Okay, um, so maybe I just give you a very, very brief idea of the proof. Very, pre very brief. Uh, and kind of the, the idea is that we have uh, two, we have two discriminant squares, basically comparing uh, these blow ups that, that we had before. So we have X and the singular point in X. And when we blow up Q, what is our exceptional divisor? It's actually going to be the projectivized tangent cone uh, of the point Q, which we can identify with this quadric, with this quadric Q. And on the other hand, we know that the blow up, this is isomorphic to the blow up of uh, the curve CQ inside of P3. And so the diagram we have on the other side is we have this curve inside of C, inside of P3, which we're blowing up. And the exceptional divisor here is going to be a P1 bundle. So this is a P1 bundle over uh, the curve CQ. And so what these two diagrams allow us to do is that they allow us, allow us to compute uh, the Betty numbers um, for, for this blow up in kind of two different ways uh, by using the Mayer Viatora sequence. And uh, one obtains the, the Betty numbers for X just by simply com comparing the two. So that's really the, the main idea. Um, so I want to highlight um, one kind of uh, some nice kind of corollaries from this this formula that we that we have. Um, the first thing that we can uh, that we can say is we can give you a, an upper bound for the defect. So it turns out that the defect can be at most six for a cubic threefold, and so uh, we can actually say exactly when it reaches. Uh, the upper bound, so the defect is going to be six exactly when X is actually a cone over a cubic surface. And so what happens here is that this uh, the group of uh, VE divisors that are not Cartier, this is generated by planes which occur as you know cones over the lines on the cubic surface, uh, subject to the relations that the lines themselves um, are subject to on, on uh, the cubic surface. And kind of the next uh, uh, kind of the next highest number for the defect it would be five, and this is uh, going to be true if and only if your x is the Segre cubic. So this is the cubic with the maximal number of nodes. So this is ten a one. And so with our with kind of like our formula. Uh, if, when you're equipped with our formula and the classification of singularities, you can actually obtain um, kind of a, a complete classification of uh, which uh, cubic four, uh, cubic threefolds rather, are Q factorial or not. So you really can uh, determine this. So you you give me a give me a combination of singularities, and I can tell you whether that cubic will be Q factorial or not. Okay. And so this kind of completely answers my uh, my first goal. We really identified which cubics um, are Q factorial or not. Um, so the next question was, OK, now that we know which ones have defect, uh, what, are, what are the possible generators? And so we kind of saw right at the beginning in the nodal case, we had kind of two possibilities. We either had um, nodal cubics which contained a plane or we had uh, cubic scrolls kind of appearing, these rational normal cubic scrolls. And it turns out this is uh, this is actually kind of the only things that that can happen. So our second result uh, is the following. So again, x is a cubic, 
uh, with isolated singularities, then the defect is uh, positive if and only if your cubic X contains a plane or a rational normal cubic scroll. Right. So we really have kind of a geometric interpretation of when this defect um, is positive. And so I guess maybe I'll say uh, just a, again, just a couple of words about the idea. So the idea of the proof really is if, if the defect is positive, then by a previous result, we know that this curve is reducible. And so we, we prove this, this result by um, identifying the possible components that appear in this curve. And there's kind of uh, three possibilities, three things that happen. So the first thing is that this CQ contains a line. So uh, these are possible components. So in the case that CQ contains a line, then you get a plane immediately inside of X by simply taking the cone over this line with vertex Q. Uh, the second thing that can happen is that you get a, a plane conic. So what is this? This this plane conic is really just a hyperplane section of the quadric that uh, CQ lies on. And so again, in this case, you, you'll get a plane. So how do we see the plane? One takes the cone over this conic, which will span a hyperplane section of X, and a hyperplane section should have degree three. So the plane here will just be the residual plane. And then finally, the kind of more like interesting um, uh, situation that happens is that uh, this CQ is actually the union of uh, two twisted cubics that lie uh, on uh, on well both the quadric and S the cubic a cubic surface. And so, like I said, um, in the nodal case, uh, this is exactly what happens in the case of six nodes. And uh, the presence of these twisted cubics allow you to give uh, X a determinantal uh, equation. So you can write the equation of X as a determinant. So in other words, X becomes det M. And so what this allows you to do is to define the following map. You get a map. Uh, to P, a rational map to P2, where a point here is sent to the coordinates ABC, where uh, ABC is exactly uh, satisfies this equation at P. And one can check that if you take a, uh, a general line inside of this P2 and uh, take the inverse image, this is actually going to be a cubic scroll uh, that's contained in your in X. So not only do you just get one cubic scroll, you actually get a, a whole family of cubic scrolls contained in contained in your cubic threefold. Okay. And so um, this theorem not only does it provide us with some like kind of geometric interpretation for the for the the um, the V divisors that are not Cartier, but it also uh, gives us some. It also kind of uh, tells us that if I have a cubic fourfold that contains either a plane or a cubic scroll, then I'm going to get such a hyperplane section. So I'm going to get a hyperplane section with, with positive defect. So um, how much time? I have 20 minutes. Okay, this is great. So so yeah, let me just maybe say, say something um, a little bit more. So there's what I can what we can say is that if we start instead with a cubic fourfold, and we, we know that it contains a plane or a cubic scroll, then um, by the results uh, that I mentioned kind of before by Brosnan, if I look at this compactified intermediate Jacobian vibration, I know that there's going to exist 
some reducible fibers which correspond to these uh, the uh, cubic three folds with defect being positive. <clears throat> And so this kind of leads us to the to the kind of uh, question is is what if I have a cubic a cubic fourfold and I assume oops assume that the defect is equal to zero for every hyperplane section. So this cubic might not be general. It might uh, might be be somewhat special, but I, I want to assume that kind of the hyperplane sections are not too singular in some sense. They they all have defect equal to zero. And so can I say anything about the intermediate Jacobian vibration in this case? And so in order to investigate this, one really needs to study uh, degenerations of intermediate Jacobians as cubic threefolds become singular. And so I want to talk a little bit a little bit about this. So intermediate uh, Jacobians, kind of for singular x, singular cubic threefolds. And so if you want to study the intermediate Jacobian, the kind of main tool uh, that one uses is Mumford's description of, uh, of the intermediate Jacobian as a prim variety. So how does this go? So one chooses first you choose a line that contain that is contained on your cubic threefold. And in the case of a, if you had a smooth cubic threefold, you would want this line to be a general line. In the case of a singular uh, cubic threefold, you also want to impose that it doesn't contain the singular points. So you want it to avoid the singular points. Um, what this choice of line allows one to do is uh, is give your cubic threefold a conic bundle structure. So one can blow up the line, and a projection will give you a map uh, to P2, whose general fiber is a conic, and the singular fibers are parameterized by a quintic uh, a quintic curve, quintic plane curve, and this plane curve will come equipped with a double cover. Uh, so this is D tilde. So this is a two to one cover. So, okay, so this guy is parameterizing singular conics. And so what this curve is just parameterizing the lines contained in those singular conics. And so how does the, the prim construction go? So in the smooth case, so when X is smooth, what will happen is that this curve D tilde is uh, irreducible and the cover is an is an atal double cover. And so one can construct uh, well, it turns out that the intermediate Jacobian of X is isomorphic to the prim variety associated to this double cover. <clears throat> and so so what's the what's the prim variety? Well, one way to do it is to is to look at the uh, Jacobian variety of the top curve. You want you look at the the Jacobian variety of the of the top curve, and you uh, because we have this double cover, oops, because we have this double cover, we have a, a a covering involution on this top curve, and so we get an involution on the intermediate Jacobian. So this is tau, and one constructs the prim as I think maybe I'm. I hope I'm right, is the fixed locus of uh, maybe tau minus the identity, uh, where this is acting on the intermediate Jacobian of the top curve. Maybe you have to take a connected component, something like this. So it's kind of related to the to the Jacobian upstairs and also the 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 uh, the covering involution. And so we would like to kind of say a similar statement in the singular situation. Uh, and so, so what is known? So, um, Casalena Martin and uh, Laza, they introduced the notion 
of a so-called uh, very good line for a singular cubic. So what is a very good line? So for X singular, maybe I won't give you the precise definition, but I'll give you the important part. So it's going to be very good uh, if this associated double cover you get when you project um, satisfies kind of all the same properties in the smooth case. So it's going to be in a tal double cover between irreducible curves. And so now, I mean, X is singular, so we should expect that this curve, uh, both of these curves are going to become singular. And so indeed, the singularities of uh, DL are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the singularities of X. Um, so both in number and in type. And so this notion was also used in the result of, uh, of Laza, Sack and Vossan, who was compactifying the intermediate uh, Jacobians. And so it was kind of a very key tool in a, to be able to, com to compactify intermediate Jacobians for singular uh, cubics. And what they did is uh, they kind of, they prove that if you have a cubic threefold, whose singularities, the total Milner number is at most five, uh, then a general line is the so-called very good line. And so what this allows one to do is to, con is to, to um, construct the intermediate Jacobian of such a, the compactified intermediate Jacobian of such a, a cubic threefold. And so um, the kind of the proof of this existence or the proof that the general line is a good one um, is really a consequence of the fact that the singularities of X are kind of not too bad and the Fano variety of lines is still irreducible. Okay. And so our kind of next result is is kind of extending this existence of a very good line uh, to the case of cubic threefolds with kind of worse singularities. Um, so I guess theorem three. So if X is a cubic uh, threefold, um, then uh, there exists a very good line Uh, if and only if the defect is equal to zero. Uh, and actually, as a byproduct of, of proving this, we actually show that this is equivalent, again, to the Fano variety of lines uh, being irreducible. So this is really, um, this is really stronger than the results of LSV and also uh, Castellana, Martin and, and Laza, bec because uh, we can have singularities with like quite high Milner numbers. So for example, uh, one could have an A11 singularity and the defect is still equal to zero. Um, so this still allows you to somehow compactify the intermediate Jacobian uh, via this, uh, this prim kind of constructions. So it really is a, a sharpening of these results. Um, and so um, kind of some ongoing work is to try and uh, and use this this idea to try and, and compactify the the prim variety, uh, compactify the relative Jacobian uh, variety um, in this situation, like constructing, constructible. But I, I don't want to talk talk much more about that. So I think I have um, a few minutes uh, remaining. So I haven't really mentioned anything about my last uh, goal. So I, I'll try to maybe briefly say something. So our, our last kind of goal was to understand the cohomology or the mixed Hodge structure um, of, uh, of a singular cubic, cubic threefold. And so maybe uh, I'll give you a, a, a rough theorem, a rough theorem four, I guess. So I, I won't be so precise here, but maybe if I, if I have time, I can be a little bit more precise. Um, so we want to understand the mixed Hodge structure on uh, the middle cohomology. And so the Hodge numbers 
or the Hodge Dubois numbers rather of uh, the mixed Hodge structure on the third cohomology are kind of determined by um, some invariants uh, that are associated with the singularities of X. And so the first uh, invariant is, is obviously the defect. Uh, and so this is kind of some sort of global invariant of X. And why I say it's global is because, okay, to some extent, the singularities of X kind of determine the defect, but there's also some geometric input. It depends whether the, the singularities are kind of contained in a plane or if they're in general position. So this really takes that into account. Uh, but the Hodge numbers are determined by this, this kind of global invariant plus kind of two local invariants, uh, which are to do with the, the singularities. And these uh, two invariants, you can you can really compute. Uh, if I just give you the, the the singularity type, you can you can actually compute them, and so you can uh, completely determine the the Hodge numbers of the mixed Hodge structure. Um, so uh, maybe I can maybe I can just tell you very quickly if you're interested. Um, so what are these local invariants? The first one is uh, Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Okay. So, what what are these invariants? So, if I have a singular point of my of my cubic, I'm gonna uh, take a log resolution. This is a log resolution, or a so-called good log resolution. So, I want the exceptional divisor to be simple normal crossing, and I want when I remove it from the resolution y, this should be isomorphic to x without the singular point q. So here I'm really thinking about the singularity as being a, a germ. Um, like I said, these are kind of local invariants of the singularities. And so the first invariant that we consider is Steinbrick's du Dubois invariant. So this is uh, some kind, of, it's called BPQ. And so I'm, I'll just write down very quickly what it is. Um, so this is the uh, HQ of X. So you take a, no, sorry, on Y. You take P forms on Y, which have poles along E, and you twist by the ideal of E. So this is some, you know, some cohomology. You take the dimension of this, uh, this cohomology. And it turns out that um, for a cubic fourfold, a cubic threefold rather, or more generally like Dubois singularities, a lot of these invariants vanish. So for a cubic, kind of the only non-zero invariant is this B11. So you kind of only get one invariant. And the, the other invariant is a so-called uh, link invariant. So maybe I won't even write down what it is. Um, but uh, there's some other invariant which is to do with the link of your of your singularity. So again, you can compute this um, just by knowing the type or the local equation. And actually, these two invariants satisfy the, the following. So the Milner number of the singularity is actually equal to two times this B11 invariant plus the link invariant. And so you can compute these. Um, you can compute these invariants. And so now maybe I can say more precisely um, our theorem. So what we really compute is we compute the Hodge Dubois numbers, so these HPQ. So this is the dimension of the, the pth graded piece with respect to the Hodge filtration of HP uh, plus Q. And so for a cubic threefold, Uh, we get that H12, uh, this is equal to 5 minus the sum of all of these B invariants for each singularity. And the other number, which is the only other relevant one, is uh, 5 minus L minus sigma minus B. And so maybe, okay, these are just some numbers, but maybe if I if I draw the Hodge diagram, so diamond, so this middle cohomology has a Hodge diamond, since it has a mixed Hodge structure, and it looks like the following. In weight uh, four, you'll have z, you'll have nothing, so this is weight four. In weight three, 
you'll have um, you know, five minus L minus sigma minus B in both positions. And then in weight uh, two, you'll have L minus sigma. And so if, uh, if you have a smooth cubic, all of these invariants are zero. Like if, you, if your X is smooth, all of these invariants are zero, and so you, you recover the pure Hudge structure um, on H3 for a smooth cubic. Um, so this is how the, the Hudge structure kind of changes as your cubic becomes more singular. Um, so I think that's that's where I will uh, I will stop today. That's kind of all I all I have to say. So uh, yeah, I'll stop there.